Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number five. There's an introduction video that's video number one. That this video we're going to talk about Olber's paradox and we're going to bring questions to the Big Bang Theory. Uh, initially when I started this video I intended to use uh, astronomical observations to come up with a loss factor for light. So what I did was I figured that you know in, uh, light must have some kind of loss. So what I did is I came up with a computer simulation and this little dot here is the Earth, and I, I wanted to compute how bright the night sky should be, uh, given that this is the Milky Way galaxy, this is 100,000 light years, and I'm guessing about 200 billion stars, they say the estimate is between 100 and 400 billion, so I picked 200 billion stars. And then I said, well, if you're standing on the surface of the Earth here, and the sun's you know, on the back side of the, of the Earth, um, what should be the brightness contributed by all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy on the surface of the Earth? And so what this model came up with is that the night sky should be about 66 times brighter. And I said to myself, well, okay, what kind of efficiency of light, in other words, the efficiency of light after one light year of travel, how much percent of the energy must remain in order to bring the illumination from this galaxy down to what we normally measure? And that efficiency came up to 90 or 99.65%, um, which in an engineering term would be 0.9965. Okay, so after every light year, uh, 0.9965 or 99.65 percent of the luminous energy must remain after each light year. That would account for and bring all the luminous energy from the Milky Way galaxy down to the actual level that we measure. This led to a problem because if you then back this out, you would say, well, gee, that means light would lose 50 percent of its light in just 200 light years. And after only a thousand light years, ten percent, or I'm sorry, one percent of the way across the Milky Way galaxy, you lose ninety-seven percent of your light. So there's something wrong with this, with this factor I came up with. It's 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 too much, way too much loss. Uh, so I said to myself, well, gee, you know, I said let's look at the milk, let's look at pictures of the Milky Way galaxy. And this is a picture. And if you look at this nighttime image of the Milky Way galaxy, um, you get a little confused because there's there's stars in the foreground. Okay, any star that you can actually see, the pixel of light that you actually make out, that's a nearby star. And that kind of throws off your depth perception. So the proper way to look at this is assume you're looking at the Milky Way galaxy through a snowstorm so that your brain will block out all of the little pixels of light, which are really just the stars that are near to us. And then what your eyes will make out is there's this core, the, the Milky Way galaxy looks something like this. The core of the Milky Way galaxy is here. This bright haze are stars that are so far away, but they're so close together, they look like a bright mist, okay, which is different than the stars you see over here, which are the nearby stars. But then you notice something really amazing. You notice these big black bands of glop, gloop, for lack of a better... It looks like pollution. It looks like the stuff that comes out of Despicable, Me, Despicable Me's car that's completely blocking the view of the Milky Way galaxy. And I said to myself, well, gee, that's... This galaxy of ours is filthy dirty. And I said, well, let me find another picture of another galaxy that we're looking at edge on. And there's a picture of another galaxy outside of our galaxy, and you can see it's just as filthy dirty down the center. And you can see the band of filth. This galaxy is the Sombrero Galaxy, which is 30 million light years away. This bright haze here that you see in the middle, this bright, it looks like a bright glare. Those are actually the stars of the Sombrero Galaxy that looks like a bright haze, a bright mist. And, but the amazing thing is this is 30 million light years away and it's crystal clear. This is the, another galaxy that's 68 million light years away. Look how beautifully clear and crisp. There's like, it looks like the space in between the galaxies is remarkably clean. And let's look at one that's 450 million light years away. Again, it's crystal clear. Which would mean, and then we can go out to 7.7 .7 billion light years away and you can still see the galaxy. I mean, it's starting to look a little grainy now. But I think that that graininess is due to the fact that we're at the optical limit of the Hubble spell, uh, telescope that took this. And then you can go all the way out to 13.4 billion light years, and now you can just barely make stuff out. But still, 13.4 billion light years away. In our own galaxy, we could barely even see the center of the galaxy, which is only uh, 27,000 light years away. So this got me to thinking there's a, there's a significant problem with the universe, because it, galaxies are filthy dirty but the space between the galaxies is remarkably clean. That's how only way we'd be able to see these far-off galaxies. 
So if we did have a Big Bang Theory, a Big Bang Theory being an explosion like this, you have smoke and debris going everywhere. So why is it that inter intergalactic space is, is remarkably clean? Well, I've got a little little demonstration for you. Let's assume that this is our gal uh, this is our universe, and we've got three galaxies here. And I'm going to put some debris in the universe, donated by little rice particles here. Okay, so stuff should be all over the place. Why is the stuff not all? Why isn't there a lot of debris in intergalactic space? And somebody might say, well. It's because the galaxies are like vacuum cleaners. Okay, so fine, let's do that. Then, so if galaxies were like little vacuum cleaners, the gravity of the stars were the were the the cause, or the, the mechanism that allowed space to be clean. Then you would expect the, ga the the space in the galaxies to be super clean, and there'd be some debris in intergalactic space that would obscure our view of other galaxies. Instead, we have completely everything is completely backwards. Okay, instead, intergalactic space is remarkably clean, and the galaxies are filthy dirty. The things are backwards. And, and in the upcoming videos, I'm, I'm going to make an argument that I think a lot of what we're doing in science is backwards. Then I, I started looking online to see if there was something about the luminous intensity of Earth. There's a thing called Olber's Paradox. And what the simulation shows on Wikipedia is here's the sun, and they put the nearby stars, and then they plot the farther off distant stars, which are a little smaller, but there's more of them. And then you plot the farther off stars behind those, which are even smaller but far away, and eventually you have a night sky that's completely obscured. Your, your sky, no matter if night or day, should be as bright as the sun. You shouldn't even be able to tell the sun. And I was trying to come up and say, well, it's because of luminous losses is the reason, part of the reason. I mean, granted, the space is not, the universe is not perfectly infinite, which would make this true. Space is uh, definitely limited. So we might end up with something like this or this, but still the night sky should be brighter. But then it gets even worse. In this same Wikipedia article, they show another problem which to me is even worse than what Olber's paradox predicts. And they say that the edges of the universe are completely reflective. Okay, and that all the energy from all the stars that has ever been emitted into the universe should still be there kicking around, continually re being reflected back. And if that were the case, the Earth would have been cooked in the, in the, in the galactic easy-bake oven uh, millions and millions of years ago. And so how do, how do cosmologists rationalize this issue? They say that the edges of the universe are expanding away at, the sp at nearly the speed of light. And what happens then is the reflected energy is reflected, instead of being reflected as visible light, it's being reflected into the microwave region, which is not visible, and then they throw up their hands and say, ah, problem solved. The problem I have is that they use, they use uh, Planck's constant to show that the energy is less. Unfortunately, Planck's constant is not supposed to be used, is, is, is for emissions, not reflections. In engineering, if this is perfectly or nearly perfectly reflective, then all of your energy is reflected. Granted, you're going from a small wavelength to a large wavelength, so your energy of this wavelength is now going to be spread over a wider wavelength, but all the energy is there, it's just your power is reduced, not your energy, your power is reduced, which would mean that it doesn't solve the problem of the edges of the universe being reflective, because instead of being cooked uh, by visible light, which would cook us, we're going to be cooked by microwave energy, which, just, which would just cook us from the inside out. And, and the other problem I have, if, if the edge of the universe is traveling nearly the speed of light away, well, that means that the surface area of the universe is expanding by the speed of light squared. And where does all this highly refined reflective material come from? And where is the universe expanding into? This is beginning to sound like wildy coyote physics. I'm sorry, it's what, that's what it seems like to me. But it gets even better. Because in Hubble's law, they say that the outer, outer galaxies are accelerating and they're traveling faster than the speed of light. And they're accelerating. So wait a minute. So if the edge of the universe is only going nearly the speed of light, but the galaxies on the edges of the universe are traveling faster than the speed of light, well, we've got a mismatch here. Shouldn't the galaxies be colliding into the edge of the universe? I mean, it's just, it just gets, it's just getting out of hand. This is like wildy coyote physics on top of wildy coyote physics, and I'm sure they have a wildy coyote physics way of rationalizing this, this paradox here. Because if you look at wildy coyote, he used a lot of explosives catch the roadrunner, and it's only fitting that we have a Big Bang theory as our theory of the universe. So I no longer buy the Big Bang theory. So I'm going to introduce Distinti's universe. 
Okay, I had not intended to get ethereal mechanics into the business of cosmology, but after doing my research on Olber's paradox, I kind of say, well, we need something now. All right, so Distinti's universe, and it's version 1.0. Um, in the Big Bang Theory, the universe is expanding. In Distinti's universe, the universe is much balanced and much older. Uh, the edges of the universe, Big Bang, is highly reflective, expanding at sea. Distinti, it's a non-reflective. It's, it's more like an ablative edge with very small emissions, mostly due to nonlinearity. For Big Bang Theory, there's no explanation I could find of why intergalactic space is so clean. Distinti's universe, it's a very simple explanation. Dark matter, they can't find it. In Distinti's universe, there is none. Wormholes, they can't find them. Distinti's universe, there is none. Hubble's law, they say, is proof of the Big Bang. I, to me, it's nonsense science. Uh, Distinti's universe, I'm going to show you that Hubble's law is simply an optical illusion. Uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, they have actually have multiple theories. They say it's well explained but then they have multiple ex theories explaining it, so I don't know what, the, what they're talking about. Black holes, they say, is a singularity. I'm going to show you that if you have a mathematical equation that comes up with a singularity, then you do not have cro you're not doing proper science. I'm going to show you that black holes are just a super dense stars that may oscillate before they finally go black. Uh, in the Big Bang Theory, they have speculative uh, stuff about parallel universes and alternate realities. Uh, I'm going to borrow a term from Lady Gaga, and I'm going to say that it's very simple to show that we actually exist as part of a multiverse. Uh, with faster than light travel and the Big Bang Theory, you need a wormhole. In Distinti's universe, uh, there is you can work around this, uh, Einstein's speed limit and 100, 100, 1,000 times speed of light or better uh, is going to be a definite possibility. And the Big Bang Theory is going to end in a big crunch. In Distinti's universe, everything is slowly evaporating. It's a much more salient, sane universe. But obviously, if you're going to have a discovery show, the people are going to want to talk about wormholes and, and paradoxes and alternate universes instead of a nice, plain, simple universe. So, again, my original intent was just to develop ethereal loss to light, um, just trying to use cosmological data. Uh, ultimately, the galactic filth prevented me from getting a solution. Uh, we're going to have a different solution in a much later video. Uh, but the research for this project resulted in, a, in loss of faith in the Big Bang. It, to me, it looks like wild E. coyote physics. Um, and so I'm um, adding a Distinti's University Theorem Mechanic series. Uh, I never really intended this, but heck, you know, until we actually go to the edge of the universe, what's at the edge of the universe? Is it anybody's guess until somebody actually goes there and takes samples of the edge of the universe? So I'm going to throw my guess into the ring. So what's next? Um, the video number six is going to be conjecture about the, the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's not my real answer, which will be in a much later video, but just it's for fun. Um, we're going to take a break from giant hunting right now. We have to go back. I made the argument that we're doing things in science backwards, and the next videos are going to show you where we're doing things backwards and how to correct them so we can improve science and go forward. Pretty much I'm going to show you that we have to break away from this monkey see, monkey do physics that we've been doing for the past hundred years. That's in video number eight. Now I'm going to demystify math. Um, we have a problem that scientists think that if they derive something, it must be true, and I'm going to show you that's not true. S math is nothing more than our ability to count chickens, and it, its sole purpose is to mimic nature. It is not nature is not obliged to follow math. Um, and you can read the rest of this uh, after video eleven. We're going to return to the quest for the ether and we'll get into discussion later on of what's within those videos. Thank you. Uh, please uh, donate if you can. I really appreciate that and spread the word on these videos if you could. Thank you.